in the name of God, who on this night became incarnate in flesh among us. Amen. It was Christmas time about 10 years ago. Clellan Coy, a native of Spain, was vacationing in northern Spain in Puerto de Vega near the ocean. Early one cold morning, he woke up with his brother, sister-in-law, and his son, and they decided to walk to the beach. They thought they would brave the cold water and go for a winter swim. So they took off from the hotel, but they weren't sure which way to go. A man was walking towards them very quickly with a dog, and they asked him, which way to the beach? He said, I'm going that way. You can come with me, but I'm walking briskly. Can you keep up? Sure, they said. They walked about 10 minutes with this fellow and his dog, who was going quite fast. See over those dunes, you'll see the ocean, he said. Have a good swim. They walked over the dunes, and sure enough, a beautiful sunrise, gorgeous waves. They got out of their outer garments, had just their bathing suits on, put their towels down, and ran into the water. It was frigid. Clellan said, let's see how far we can swim out there. And so they started out, and he was swimming when he realized he was really cold. I mean, dangerously cold. So he decided to turn around and go back, but when he turned around and tried to swim back, something happened to him. You Floridians... We Floridians, we know about it. It was a riptide. He couldn't seem to swim back to shore. He kept trying, and it was pulling him out further and further. In a panic, he remembered to go diagonally, and he screamed at his family, Stop going out, follow me. They started to swim at a diagonal. The waves were overpowering. They were making some slow progress when one of the waves just flipped him around. Clellan would later write about what it felt like to be totally helpless in the ocean not knowing which way was up or which way was down, completely out of control and terrified because he was so helpless and didn't know if he would live or die. Did you know that the early Christians did not worship the Christ child? The early Christians focused on Jesus as an adult. They started with his baptism and learned all about his ministry and his crucifixion and resurrection, but they didn't pay much attention to the baby. It's really not surprising that they didn't make much of Jesus' birth. After all, Jesus' birth only occurs in two out of the four Gospels. In Matthew and in Luke. And those two Gospels 
tell two very different stories. Matthew talks about Joseph and what it was like when Joseph had a dream and an angel appeared to Joseph in that dream. In Matthew, wise men come to the manger bearing gifts. Luke tells the story from the perspective of the women, from Elizabeth and Mary. The angel appeals to Mary, not in a dream, but in real life. And angels appear to shepherds who come to the manger. The early Christians were probably confused about all this, so they didn't focus much on the baby until 1,000 years after Jesus' birth, one of my favorite saints, who you all know well, St. Francis, you know the guy whose statue we put in our gardens, the one who loved animals? It was St. Francis who first created a nativity scene, a live nativity with animals and the baby in the manger and Mary and Joseph And it was Francis who taught the Christians and said, you must learn to adore the child, the baby lying in a manger. Because when God became a baby, God was telling us something very, very important about who we are and about who God is. When you think about it, why would God want to become a baby? If I were God, I would want to be Superman, but that's out because he's make-believe. Sorry, kids. Or I'd want to become someone like a knight in shining armor, or at least a firefighter or a pilot or something strong. Why would God want to become someone so helpless? You know, of all the creatures of the earth, the human baby is the most helpless. I mean, horses get up and walk within four hours. The baby cardinal birds, well, their moms push them out of the nest after about 10 days and they're flying. But human babies? Most of us can't eat solid food, can't even lift our heads. We're totally helpless and dependent on others for a long time, for years, in fact, until until we become self-sufficient. So why would God become so helpless? You know, every single one of us was born helpless. And if we live the full human lifespan, we'll probably die kind of helpless too. And not only Jesus was helpless, but he was born, if you remember, in the midst of the Middle East with a king who was trying to kill babies in the midst of violence and war just like we have today. Why would God choose to be born so helpless in a war zone? To be born probably in a cave dug in the side of a hill. That's where they placed the animals to shelter them from the wind. It would have been dirty and smelly and scary. When Clellan was flailing around in that wave, something happened to him just at that moment when he felt most helpless. This overwhelming peace came over him. He realized that there was this all-encompassing all-powerful presence all around him, in the waves, in the water, in the air. 
and that even though he didn't know whether he would live or die, somehow he knew he was well and that everything would be okay. Our church is very ancient. We wear all these fancy robes and do all this funny stuff, but it's thousands of years old. And every time you come to worship, you come to the altar rail and you hold out your hands and we feed you. Jesus feeds you bread and wine. Because when it comes to matters of death and dying, we all are like little children. When I do a funeral and someone has lost the person they love most in the world, we have to hold them up sometimes because they might fall. We have to make sure that they eat something because they become like a little child again. Do you know how to comfort a baby? If a baby's crying, what it wants and what is most comforting is for you to put something in its mouth to feed that child. And that's what God is doing for you when you come to the altar rail and hold out your hands. God is putting something in your mouth to say at a most primal level, everything's going to be okay. I believe that our world is at a turning point. We have tried so hard to have all the answers. We have tried so hard to develop the greatest industry and technology. And all that we're doing is hurting the planet. And we continue to war with one another. But maybe what God is trying to tell us is that we don't have to have all the answers. That's when we admit that we are, in fact, powerless before the mighty God who made the universe. It's in that very moment that God comes to us most powerfully. That we can be transformed into something more. I have a friend who's a mathematician. He said he spent his whole life trying to get all the problems right until he had his PhD. And then he was at the cutting edge of mathematics and he realized that he couldn't solve the problems on his own. He had to admit he didn't have the answer. And then somehow in that emptiness, in the not knowing, the answer would come to him like a gift. My mother writes music and she says the same thing. It's when she lives in the emptiness, in the not knowing, in the not having all the answers that all of a sudden a song will come into her mind. You know the famous artist Pablo Picasso said, when he was introduced to the concept of a computer, he said, I don't want one of those. They have all the answers. Maybe we need to remember that we human beings are fairly helpless and that God loves us not because we do anything or accomplish anything, but God has adored us from the moment we were born. In fact, God became a baby to tell us just that. Adoration means gazing upon something with love. So tonight, as we dim the lights and you sing Silent Night, gaze upon that child, that helpless child, and adore him. And know that St. Francis got it right. Oh, come, let us adore the one who tells us it's okay to be human. It is in our humanity that God meets us and we are transformed. 
McClellan and his family got out of the water miraculously and started on their way home and they came across that guy walking the dog and he didn't know what to say because everything seemed to have changed for him. But for the guy walking the dog, they had just gone for a swim. But from that day forward, McClellan would give every day his gratitude, every breath, because he knew that life was a gift and that it was not his to take or give away. It was a gift to be grateful for. Amen.